Hello, everybody. This is the Cincinnati Herald podcast. I'm your host, John Alexander Reese, digital editor of the Cincinnati Herald. If you don't know, the Cincinnati Herald has been around since 1955 and is the largest African American newspaper in the greater Cincinnati area. And today, my guests include co host and media consultant of the Cincinnati Herald, Andrea Carter. How are you doing today, Andrea? Fantastic, John. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. We also have Circulation Director, Wade Lacey Sr. How are you doing today, Wade? Hello, John. As always, it's good to be here. Glad to have you with us. Then we also have our Herald intern, Suhana Sinhan. How are you doing today, Suhana? I'm doing fantastic, John. Thank you so much for having me. Glad that you're here. And then with us, we have special guest, Dr. Tyra Odom. How are you doing today, Dr. Odom? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Thanks for coming on. So, Let's head into some of the top news topics of the week. And our first topic is concerning the May 4th primary. Avtab Perival, Hamilton County Clerk of Courts, and David Mann, Cincinnati City Councilman, advanced in the Cincinnati mayoral primary election on Tuesday, running ahead of four other candidates to challenge each other for the city's top position in the November 2nd general election. Issue three, which would have funded a city affordable housing fund in the amount of $50 million each year, failed. Candidate Aftab Perival has been serving as Hamilton County Clerk of Courts since 2017. Councilman David Mann served as mayor on two occasions from 1980 to 1982 and in 1991 and served on the city council from 1974 to 1992 before returning to office in 2013. In Cincinnati, only 15% of the voters turned out for the May 4th primary. Voters could only vote for one mayoral candidate. Also on the ballot were issues one and two grew out of the federal bribery charges against three city council members, Tamaya Dennard, Jeff Pastor, and PG Sindenfeld in 2020. Both of those issues passed as well. Andrea, your thoughts on this topic? Well, it, it was... It was an interesting night to watch the results come in, um, to see who um, the voters favored um, for the mayoral race. The top three vote getters that everyone assumed was going to be Aftep Perval, David Mann, and Cecil Thomas. Um, some speculated that it was going to come down between Aftab and Cecil, and ousting David Mann because he's been around so you know he's been around for so long that people would want new blood. But come to find out. Aftab led the entire night from early voting through with all the results coming in. He led with, I believe it was 76% of the vote and David Mann only led with, um, I believe it was like 23 or 28% of the vote. Cecil barely caught David Mann. He, I mean, he was on his heels, but he wasn't even close enough to catch up. You know, and, you, and you, you would think there would be more of a fight between Cecil and David because they've both been around for so long in Cincinnati politics, while Aftab is relatively new to the area, even though he's run for Congress twice and he's won for clerk of courts. So it was a very good race from that perspective. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in November. Yes, definitely. Wade, your thoughts on this story? Well, I was... Uh... As, as we had talked before earlier this year, I thought it was going to be a two-man race between Cecil and uh, David Mann. Um, I think the low turnout, <laughs> the very low turnout hurt Cecil uh, the most. Uh, he didn't get those uh, voters that I think would vote for him if they had voted. I figured Mann would be in there. Uh, he has a lot of the, the uh, West Side and the uh, business people behind him. So he has a following there. Uh, I hope, it's my hope, that uh, the public, the minority the public that, that, that uh, at best is, is, is not, or has, does not have a short memory. Uh, I remember the, the uh, hateful campaign that David Mann ran against Senator Bolton. And uh, that always stuck with me, that told me what type of person he was. And so I hope that the community does not forget uh, the type of campaign he ran back then, because that tells you a lot of a lot of what he thinks about us. So uh, it should be interesting. I don't want the public to uh, get complacent. I think if you look at the recent mayoral races, the primaries, 
I think the primaries uh, a lot of times will favor someone. They, they'll win the primary uh, easily. And then when the real <laughs> voting uh, takes place in, uh, in September or November, uh, it's a different story. So uh, he has his work, AFTAP has his work cut out for him in the real race because I think the previous two mayor, mayoral primaries, I think the other opponent, the one, I think the opponent that won the primary loss in the bachelor uh, race. Well, I, I think what's also was interesting is that the young people didn't turn out for the primary because during the protests last year, all the young people were upset with David Mann when he left that meeting and he, when they were questioning him because he, he's such a long-term um, civil servant and he didn't have any answers, he got up and he left and they all vowed that he would not be reelected. So I didn't see any evidence of that anger staying around or young people coming to vote in the primary. So it's gonna be interesting to see how they get stirred up for the November election. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point because it's like, yeah, you want the guy out, but if you don't come and vote, like, it was all for nothing. Suhana, what are your thoughts on this story? Hey, John, um, my simple thoughts of this story is, first of all, the the voting, the amount of people who turned up for voting are really low. And uh, that makes it very difficult to really understand how uh, the Cincinnati feels about their candidate because 15% is just not enough to represent the whole city's opinion. But might as well, those who have showed up and selected their leaders, the leaders should live up to the promises they're making and the duties that they must fulfill. Last Since last year, the whole country has gone through a big pandemic and now we are finally coming in control. There are a lot of issues that need to be taken care of in this city. And uh, I hope like those promises are not forgotten and kept on the back seat. That's whoever comes in power should just even though it's by 15 percent of the votes i hope they represent the best of the whole city i don't have much opinions i think i would like to see how it turns out for the city in the end yes definitely so moving on to our next topic which is about vice president kamala harris visiting cincinnati 101 days since coming into power, Vice President Kamala Harris is impressed with Cincinnati's recent investment of the $130 million a year levy for Cincinnati Metro, road and bridge projects throughout Hamilton County. Harris visited Cincinnati last Friday for the first time as Vice President to discuss improvements in Cincinnati and the world. Her visit to the region helped to promote the Biden administration's American Jobs Act, which includes funds to create jobs and help improve the country's infrastructure that is in need of improvement. Funding for a new Brent Spence Bridge is possibly included in the bill. Um, Andrea, what are your thoughts on uh, Vice President Harris's uh, recent visit to Cincinnati? Well, I, I think it was admirable that she came to Cincinnati. Also, the fact that we have an important piece in the, that's listed in the American Jobs Act bill is the Brent Sprint's Bridge. It needs to be replaced, it needs to be funded, it's in the bill. I think the fact that she came to talk about transportation and the economy just showed and expressed the importance of how that bridge plays in the, the jobs bill. Um, I think the fact that she was met by Kentucky Governor Andy Beshear is also very important. Again, shows how important the, the whole situation is. And um, she stopped by Black Coffee, the Black Coffee Lounge as well to, um, you know, showcase Black business as a last minute stop, which I think also was um, comforting for everybody to see that she's involved and knows what's important to her, not just as a politician, but also as a Black woman supporting her community. Wade, your thoughts on the vice president's uh, recent visit to Cincinnati? I was happy to see her here, uh, mainly because a lot of times after the election, the vice president disappeared. And her coming here and, and the role that she's been playing in the administration these uh, first few months uh, shows that she's got an active, active role in, in the administration and that she'll be uh, seen and heard from and, and what she's doing is considered important. Uh, as a vice president and as a person 
uh, they really value what she brings to the table. I also like the elbow bump that they gave when she came off the airplane. Suhana, so I know you were there, you know, when um, Vice President Harris was speaking. What was that experience like? So, John, uh, she came in here for to promote the American Jobs Act. And uh, through her, though she came here for the first time, the response from the people was so overwhelming. Uh, people were crowding around the streets with banners, and we even saw some Trump supporters there. And it almost felt like uh, she came here to, for her own promotions. Like it, the, the his response was so overwhelming. But when we were sitting in the conference, I saw that her presence and her questioning of uh, how Cincinnati is doing with its transportation and its developing economy made uh, the leaders answer some like talk about some of the challenges that the community has in terms of its transportation and what are the things they should do in future to improve it. Moreover, I believe like this has brought a spotlight on Cincinnati in general, because uh, though the leaders sitting there have made some promises and uh, they talked about this kind of particular innovations, like changing the, changing the diesel buses into green buses and uh, developing the city infrastructure for uh, reducing the rates of crime and poverty and connecting people with better jobs. This kind of puts Cincinnati in spotlight because now there is expectations for them to do this. This is also makes it very exciting to understand that uh, the development of Cincinnati is backed by the Biden-Harris administration because we learned that uh, in previous two administrators, uh, which is Trump and Obama administrations, were not able to uh, give better focus to Cincinnati compared to this administration. Moreover, I felt that her presence here, apart from checking on the transportation, the developments on the Brent Spence Bridge, or talking about the COVID cases that are rising in India, her stop at a small Black business was amazing because uh, it showed like, it almost felt like that there was no political agenda behind it, but just a sheer understanding of showing support towards the race and towards the economic disparity that the small businesses have faced during this pandemic. I think it was overall a very fruitful trip for uh, Kamala Harris visit in Cincinnati. I think people also had a good experience with it. But, and I have, I don't know what will turn out of this meeting, but uh, I certainly feel like Cincinnati is taking an important place in the whole act and the plans for the future rebuilding America. And moving on to our third story, which is the opening of the new soccer stadium. This past Saturday was the ribbon cutting for the West End Stadium, which is now officially named the TQL Stadium in Cincinnati, Ohio. Don Garber, Major League Soccer Commissioner, Jeff Birding, President of FC Cincinnati, and Hamilton County Commissioner President Stephanie Summero Dumas were there to cut the ribbon to open the new stadium. The 26,000 seat venue, which was designed by global design firm Populous, is located on 12.4 acres at 1501 Central Parkway. Located in downtown Cincinnati, the stadium boasts a striking presence that connects two historic neighborhoods over the Rhine and West End and positions the venue as an ambassador to the Queen City while giving fans a spectacular game day experience inside and out. FCC will officially open their 2021 home slate on Sunday, May 16th, when the team hosts Inter Miami CF in the inaugural match at TQL Stadium in a nationally televised 4 o'clock p.m. game. Wade, your thoughts on the opening of this new soccer stadium? I'm not a big soccer fan. However, I understand the importance of this uh, opening and, and, and having that, that uh, league here in Cincinnati. This, along with some of the other things that Cincinnati is doing, is, is very huge for the city. Uh, I saw where uh, Alicia Reese was uh, talking last week uh, down at the banks about a, uh, I, want, I believe it was a Black Music Hall of Fame. And all, when you put all these things together, Cincinnati, the Washington Park, and the banks, and all these other things that are going on in Cincinnati, Cincinnati is very attractive, very attractive. And so uh, this, along with uh, some of the other things that are going along, uh, here in Cincinnati are, are very good. Andrea, your thoughts on the op opening of the uh, new soccer stadium? Well, um, I think it's a great thing because it is an example of the changing focus 
of what is important to the community in, in the sports arena. Um, I mean, a lot of children are growing up playing soccer. Um, I think that's important. The, the, as in more immigrants come to the country, soccer is their love and it needs to be addressed. Plus the whole world loves their football, so to speak. But I think also what is also telling is the changes that are coming into the West End neighborhood. Again, there is uh, a, a new entity, a new development um, that's going to attract further development and interest in the Western neighborhood. Um, it's going to change. It's going to force some people out of the area. Um, and I think it, it's going to be a detriment to that neighborhood because they're going to need parking garages. They're going to need more room, more space. That means eventually um, what has been a historical presence in the, in the neighborhood, Taft High School, um, St. Joseph Catholic Church, they're all, and including District 1, they're all, they're, their future in that spot is up in the air because that stadium is going to, um, the crowd that attends that stadium is going to be a detriment to that school, to the police department, and then eventually everyone's going to be looking for, we need to spread out and more parking garages. So that neighborhood is going to change once again from what it originally was. And I think what's sad is that the residents who have lived there forever never get to participate in the change. They never get to have a say in the changes in their neighborhood. And forever, it's always the Black resident who is a victim to progress and never part of the progress, even though they're doing their best to incorporate and make equity part of the stadium. But at the same time, I didn't see any equity partners when they proposed this. I didn't see any equity partners in the ownership of the team. So I think Cincinnati has a long way to go. Um, the future of the West End neighborhood is in the hands of the future of what that may be, we don't know. So it's just gonna be interesting to see what change is, but you know, change is gonna to come to Cincinnati. On terms of agreeing with Andrea that the big changes are coming for Cincinnati because uh, the stadiums is infrastructure and uh, the overall a presentation looks like they want it to be a candidate for uh, FIFA tournaments in future. And if that happens, uh, if it gets qualified for the future FIFA tournaments, uh, we can see that there, the city, like with any new infrastructure that attracts a massive attention, it, will, it might bring in a lot of crowd, which shows that there might be a potential for the Cincinnati's overall growth but um, what happens is that when you get an influx of uh, pop popularity for some time, and when that popularity is gone, it leaves behind this lot of ruins, like a lot of empty businesses, a lot of empty coffee shops and food places. And uh, if the growing, if the coming, um, if the growing opportunities and already existing powers can somehow find a beautiful middle ground, in maintaining, uh, in helping Cincinnati grow into something more and yet not lose its uh, existence completely because the city has to be, if there is a huge influx of crowd, it expects in future, the roads have to be built differently. Uh, the transportation has to be invested really well. A um, lot of places have to be opened up for people to stay and move along the city and it should be ready to accommodate a big population. But at the same time, the city should also be ready that when we are making changes like this, we are also ready that if the population goes, if that popularity goes down, how we handle the city. And if we can still maintain that, um, there, there is like a great future ahead of Cincinnati or the this opportunity can really mean into nothing. But I would still say that even if um, this doesn't get qualified for FIFA, uh, since it's like an exciting new stadium for Cincinnati, and I think it gives something for the local people to talk about for some time. Yes, definitely. And um, Dr. Odom, you had an opinion on this new story, so go ahead and share. Yes, um, my concern about uh, soccer, uh, well, actually football, is that it's a global sport, um, and it creates a lot of, of energy and passion um, I don't think that's been considered uh, when putting it inside of a, a neighborhood 
or community. Um, so if you look around the world, I mean, a lot of things happen around football. Um, and I don't know if the city is ready for that kind of, uh, of energy. Um, and I think that's important. And I think Andrea and Suhana have, have made a, a clear point that um, it's gonna bring changes to that community. It's gonna bring changes to that city. I mean, to our city. And um, I think culturally we need to think about how football is going to impact our city. Um, you know, you can start with a great idea, but we also have to think about um, cultural competence and how things roll out um, that are effective for everybody and safe for everyone. That was just my, my comment. Thank you. And uh, that does it for the top news topics uh, for the week. And now I want to uh, hand it over to uh, Dr. Tyra Odom. And uh, how are you doing today, doctor? I'm very good, I'm very good. These topics were, um, were on point and uh, necessary to discuss. Yes, I, I, I definitely agree with that. So um, you have written a couple articles for the Herald already and they are about care, right? Yes. Can you go into a little bit more detail on what the articles are about? Yes. Um, um, <laughs> The article is called Care Corner. Um, I have been taking care of my mom for some time now, and it has been the hardest job I've ever had. I'm uh, hands over. I have worked for dilettantes. I have worked for international companies, and this is the hardest job I've ever had because there's so many complexities and it changes day to day. But what I wanted to share, and, and the reason that I approached the Herald is because care is so important. Um, and people need to start thinking about a care, you know, about their own care and about the care for their families. Um, and so I wanted to communicate that to, to people and also allow people to ask questions um, because a lot of people now ask me questions like, what should I, you know, when should I start thinking about my parents? Or um, how do you know what the signs of, you know, who do I talk to if there's uh, some signs of dementia? Um, uh, what kind of services are needed or necessary? And, and just to wrap this up is that it's very important uh, for people to start thinking about their care early. When you're, in a, when you're a child, your parents care for you. Um, and so that's the caregiving that you're receiving. But as soon as you become adult, um, you need to think about what's your care plan. So my topics that I've been looking at is what's your care plan? How are you going to care for yourself? And I think COVID really brought out uh, a very um, blatant point that you, know, you can be, <laughs> you may not have anyone to care for you. So there were people that were actually isolated by themselves that didn't have any support. And if they had a care plan or a, a care contingency, um, some of that could have been mitigated. And so, you know, you could be 20 and you could break your leg or something could happen to you, what's your care plan? Um, and so I've just been trying to talk to people and respond to the needs um, that people have as, as it relates to, you know, as their parents get older or as their, one of their spouses need care, um, or uh, even as a, even the people who are professionals who are actually providing care. Um, it is one step away from hospitals. It is one step away from a doctor's office, the people who provide care. Um, if they weren't providing care, there are a lot of people who would not make it uh, day to day. Now, one question I wanted to ask you is like, what do you think is the ideal age to start thinking about long-term care? Like I'm 32 right now. So do you think I should like start being concerned about, you know, setting up like a long-term care type of plan? I, I definitely do. Um, there are great companies out there. Uh, you're planning for your future uh, because uh, my philosophy, if you are fortunate enough, you too will get old. And if you get old, um, being I'm gonna just tell you, getting old is not cheap. Um, and that was another reason that I wanted to write this article. So yes, I think thinking about long-term care and long-term care companies is a great solution. Um, and you don't have to be rich to have long-term care. Uh, and you don't have to be rich to start thinking about how you can care for yourself in the future. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Odom? Uh, yeah, I'm going to come, right, come at it from a different end. Uh, what about the, the uh, young folks? Because I, as I get older and everything, I've, I've started to see more and more of it and everything where the, uh, the parents or the grandparents or the elderly, they... Uh, it at a point where they can't do for themselves and, and someone has to step in. And uh, once they do step in, the young, younger uh, children or whatever, 
they find out that it's much more than they thought it would be. Uh, do you have any uh, any uh, thoughts for them on those challenges that they are going to 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 uh, come into? Uh, I think that's a great question. I think you have to teach your children what you want them to do for you in the future. They have to see you delivering those kind of services or planning it. That's that's a part of your care plan. If your child is 20 now, you start talking to them. You know, my mother started saying to her to, to me when she was like 30, I have my long-term care. I have my long-term care. Okay. So okay. Um, and she also took care of her mother. So it showed me what the roadmap would be a little bit. Um, and I think you know, teaching your children that, yes, you know, it's your responsibility to care for your parents. Globally, that is what happens. Uh, America is kind of different. So we have to we have to teach our children that it's a responsibility to do, and it's hard. And so if you start planning now, um, you can start to groom, if that's, a, if that's the best word, or teach, or educate, or instruct on some of the things that a person may need. And just allowing people to see what aging looks like. I mean, it, 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 it's a beautiful thing, but yes, it's, it's hard and it can be challenging. So I think if, if I'm ans answering your question, Wade, it's really just teaching and educating young people on what the future can be. And then also educating them that you, you might do this for your grandparents or your parents, but somebody needs to do it for you as well. So it, it becomes a generational thing in a pipeline. I hope that answered your question. Um, Tyra, let me ask you this question. How do you handle parents who fear writing down what they want or how they want to be cared for because they believe putting it on paper will advance their death? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, there's a lot of spookyology around different things. I think um, if, if those people have relationships with doctors, um, I think sometimes it's hard for a family member to facilitate some things. Sometimes professionals need to, to facilitate. So maybe counsel on aging would be a good place to talk with and share that with. Uh, they're willing to uh, engage in conversation. Um, the Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's uh, Association is willing to come out and talk with people. Um, and so there are also practices that focus on gerontology. I think having someone that's a professional can, can lead the way and open up a conversation. And this doesn't have to be a scary thing. I know a lot of times people don't want to prepare for, you know, financially because, you know, they, they think it's impending death. But these are not things that you really have to think about impending death. I mean, you're, you're talking about what would you want, how would you want a doctor to care for you? Um, how would you want your, uh, how would you want to be buried? You know, is that cremation? you know, is that uh, in a casket, you know, all these different things. And it doesn't have to be done on a day. It can be done over time, depending on what stage the person that you're caring for or what stage you're in. Um, so I think it can be subtle. It doesn't have to be aggressive. Um, I think writing it down and then kind of documenting and just kind of interjecting it into conversations may be a better way for people like that, that, that it, it's bothersome, it's scary, so that they're not overwhelmed. We don't want to overwhelm someone but we want to get the information that's vital and important for the rest of their life for their care. Well, also, are you preparing or do you have suggestions for people who don't have Alzheimer's, who don't have dementia, but say, you know, like in my situation with my mother, she suffered a stroke and then she could not move. She could not talk, but through community, through how we communicated, I could tell she had her memories and the way she responded to different things. You're not prepared for that. How do you prepare someone for the unexpected and handle it because it can be overwhelming when caring for a parent? I think that's a great question. I think when you know that your parents are of a certain age or it, it could be any age, I mean, things happen to people. Um, I think understanding that, um, you know, this care corner is really going to share some light, you know, finding physical therapists, finding um, a good uh, GP, general, you know, a, a doctor. And then trying to learn about what the deficits are for someone who has a stroke or the deficits that someone has when they're ill and trying to serve those deficits. And if you're unable to do that, because everyone cannot deliver care, uh, everyone is, you know, sometimes it may be scary, but finding someone that maybe can do that to fill in the gaps where you can't. If you're fortunate to have brothers and sisters or family members, maybe finding out a plan that kind of uh, integrates everyone into that plan. Um, so that you can rotate uh, services and solutions. 
because uh, it can be scary taking care of a parent and take and seeing them change um, because you don't really think about your parents changing uh, until it happens. Do you have a template or document some type of thing that that has a ground uh, 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 steps that need to be taken type thing? Oh, I actually do because when I first started this, I had huge, I created huge notebooks and systems um, to kind of support myself. So yeah, I do have documentation that people could think about um, and start thinking and planning uh, no matter what age. So yes. Now, Suhana, I believe you had a question too. Yes, John. I wanted to ask, uh, good evening, Ms. Tara. I really wanted to know that growing up is in general a very uh the discovering process like it's not if nobody really grows up and at the age of 18 or 21 you're handed a pamphlet which says hey this is welcome to adulthood these are the rules and these are the child possible challenges you will face and welcome to this journey it's it's a very it's a process where you are constantly learning and figuring out yourself when adults barely understand that uh, what are the care and circumstances they will face and the care they will need. It's a bit, it's so far of a conversation for them to uh, untimely inform their children about their, what they care. Is there any organized business that where people can go and get prepared about the challenges they might face? And I'm not saying in the metaphorical terms, but in terms of body physical conditions and uh, the financial or health-wise, all the challenges that come around when you start aging? Um, there are agencies that are out there. Um, like I said, Council on Aging is one um, that would be willing to converse and talk. Um, there are um, people that are actually legal that represent the aging and would be willing to talk. But really, it is a process of kind of baptism by fire. And what's very sad is there's not a lot of communication on how to plan. And that's why I wanted to create this article because I had to find solutions for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I think also working with your insurance agency, you know, I, I communicate with my mother's insurance agency transparently and clearly. I think there are, even though we may not love insurance companies, uh, when you have health needs, they're your friend. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean when I say they're mm -hmm. your friend, they're, you've been paying into it and you need the services. Um, and so communicating with them uh, about where, because they have uh, each um, uh, insurance agency has uh, counselors um, that are available if you speak with them. And I think what happens is a lot of times we don't know what, what's out there. Um, and so you have to find a roadmap for yourself, um, but also just talking to the people that you're already working with, your medical professions, you know, social services, uh, you know, uh, aging um, organizations um, mm -hmm. that are out there. So ma'am, uh, my follow-up question to this is, when people hear about care, their first assumption is that it is only in terms of medical aspect. You being an expert on the, how strategically planning on the, the caregiving, which is not associated in medical terms, how did you prepare for the qualification of today of uh, talking about and pre and helping people out in their health. How did you prepare your journey or how did you prepare your, your knowledge that you have today? Um, thank you for asking that. Um, I, by trade, I'm an organizational development person and a systems person. I, I saw my mother do care for her mother. Um, and we actually selected when my mother, my grandmother moved to a nursing home, we were there together. But I, it's like anything, um, I was told if you do something for over 10,000 hours, you become a professional. I did this for over 10,000 hours. Um, just getting involved, making decisions. Um, when my mother first said to me, you know, I wanted her care, we did a um, power of attorney. We did all these different things. And I, I just learned by doing. And it was a, to be honest with you, Suhana, it was a, it was very difficult, very challenging. And it still can, it still is on some days. And it was overwhelming. And that's why I wanted to share that with people because the journey is hard. Uh, it's long, uh, it's complicated. I think um, Andrea could probably substantiate that taking care of her mom. It, it's not something that you, you can really plan out, but if you plan ahead, uh, I think it will give you a better opportunity to facilitate changes. 
that uh, occur. I, I agree with you. It was trial by fire. I mean, I now know more about facilities, the medical community, the racism in the in the medical community, um, and how the elderly is, is treated than I ever knew before. I mean, it was a whole new world that I just was dropped into when my mother had her stroke. And on top of that, she didn't wake up for almost two and a half months. So that's a whole experience of first waiting. And while you're waiting, you're being bombarded for care, money, where is she going to go? Who's going to do this? How are you going to handle her bills, your bills? Mm -hmm. um, and these were conversations that we sort of had and we sort of knew, but we didn't know. And I encourage everybody right now, even I need to do this, is put together a plan that Tyra is talking about because you are dropped in and you are smacked with all that goes on when you have to take care of someone. Um, and if you're not prepared and you don't have those conversations, I'm just lucky that we had a few conversations so I knew where to look for information. But even then we were struggling to find some things because my mother had a very quirky way of finding stuff away that was needed to help facilitate the, the monetary and things like that. So, I mean, it's, I know people don't like to talk about it and Tyra, you're doing a good thing, but I recommend everyone start now putting together a living will, putting together what your wishes are because down the road, if you can't talk, nobody can get that information out of you of what you want or what you like. You're gonna be in a room by yourself, not be able to express what your needs are. Someone's gonna have to guess. So if you can give someone a road map, the guessing will not be that that hard. And if you're and if you're having to guess, it's probably not going to be on your behalf. If a medical professional is having to guess on your behalf, it's not going to be the best. So you know, my last article was get a health proxy, get a living will, and and start there. You know, it's important because again, it can happen at 22 or it can happen at 85. I mean, you just don't know. Um, and start putting together like a folder you know, get a uh, accordion file folder or either you can do it on, on your computer or whatever and just start putting together information. Um, and you don't have to be rich to do a living will. It's a document that you can do yourself. Um, you can, you know, you can get a health proxy. You can do that with someone. And I think young people need to reach out and say, okay, if you're not married, uh, even if you're married, what, what are your spouse's wishes? Uh, and if you're not married, you know, get a best friend or a friend that you can count on that can speak on your behalf. Um, that's willing to have conversations with a doctor for you it, because you are thrown into this. You, you can plan, but you don't know what you're going to plan for. I mean, you could be planning for cancer or you could be planning um, and it could end up being a car accident. Um, so you just don't know. But if you have some idea of what you're planning for, that this is what someone's wishes are, this is how I want to be treated. Um, I, I don't wish to have a DNR. I do wish to have a DNR or, or um, I don't wish to stay at home because I, I know Tuhana, you asked me that things that weren't medical. I don't wish to stay at home. If I become a certain age, maybe I want to go to a nursing facility. Um, it, uh, you know, finding out uh, what kind of, um, you know, blood pressure, all these different things, I guess that's going back to medical, but just things that people like, you know, if you had to take care of your mom or your sister, what are the foods that they like? What, what, how would they want to be treated? Um, what are the things they like to still do? You know, um, those are things that are important that are not medical. Um, you know, is it important that they get their nails done or their hair done? Is it important that they see friends? You know, uh, you may have to be someone's social calendar, um, you know, uh, making sure that your parent or friend or whatever is, is talking to their friends. So making sure you have a list of phone numbers of, of the people that you, that you love um, so that you can coordinate that kind of thing. Um, and making sure you know where things are in a person's home, where their phone lists are, uh, where their medications would be, you know, where, where, where the things that they need in their life, what kind of clothing they like. I mean, so it's all those things, just learning a person so that you can facilitate change for them. Indeed. Well, that was a lot to take in, but it is a very important topic, uh, Dr. Odom. So I want to thank you for uh, coming on today's show. And thank you for having me and um, follow the article Care Corner and it's online and in the Herald newspaper and 
um, it's here for you and email uh, info at, at care at carecorner.info if you have any questions. Um, I'm here to answer any questions and be, be, support, be supportive. If I don't know the answer, I'll find out for you. Thank you to the Herald for hosting this and, and uh, hosting the articles uh, and, and finding that it is important for people. Yes, indeed. And I also wanted to thank uh, Suhana and Andrea and Wade for coming on our show also. Great job, guys. If you like the topics we discussed today, make sure to check out the stories on our website at www.thecincinnatiherald.com. You can also check out our print edition, which is sold at your local Kroger, UDF, Walgreens, Joseph Beth Booksellers, and at select service stations. Our podcast is now on Spotify, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and on TuneIn Radio. Just search for the Cincinnati Herald podcast on those streaming services. Uh, follow us at the Cincinnati Herald on Facebook. Follow us at Cincy Herald on Twitter and Instagram. Follow us on YouTube. Just search for the Herald TV. You can also follow us on TikTok. Uh, just type in the Cincinnati Herald. And make sure to get vaccinated, folks, so we can reach herd immunity and go back to normal, please. I'm John Alexander Reese, digital editor of the Cincinnati Herald, and have a good day.